When Strom Thurmond was 23, he had a brief affair with a 15-year-old maid in his house. The maid's name was Carrie Butler, and she was black. As it turns out, actions have consequences, and on October 12th of 1925 in Edgefield, South Carolina, Strom Thurmond's first daughter would be born. Her name was Essie May, and if you know anything about the South, you would know that this put her in a difficult spot from the get-go. The Thurmond family has power, and a relatively poor servant girl most certainly did not. Little Essie May was born in a strange spot to even stranger circumstances. Her mother was, of course, several years younger than her father, to a very illegal extent. Statutory violations, everybody. Fuck, am I even allowed to joke about this? Probably not, so we're just gonna move on. Furthermore, on a large scale, this would not have looked good for Thurmond or Carrie Butler if this became public knowledge. As I said, the Thurmond family had a great deal of importance, and this is South fucking Carolina in the 1920s. Misgeniation was very much a crime at this point in time. Fun, well, not fun, fact. In South Carolina, this was constitutionally illegal. This particular law could have jailed both Carrie and Thurmond, so even his overwhelming whiteness couldn't save him. It would be technically illegal until 1967, when the Supreme Court case Loving v. Virginia overturned all of these laws in all states as unconstitutional. Despite this, it would not be officially legalized until 1972, and the errata in the state's constitution would not be formally removed until 1998. So, saying that S.E. May was in a very tough spot would be the understatement of the century. Naturally, her mother made the difficult choice of sending her daughter away. She was raised by her mother's sister and her husband in Coatesville, Pennsylvania. The first part of her last name, name, Washington, came from her adoptive father, and the hyphen Williams would be added later when she got married. Here, she lived as normal a life as possible, blissfully unaware of her origins. She would not learn of her true heritage until she was in her teens in 1938. Her mother told her abruptly that the person she was living with wasn't actually her mom when she was visiting. However, it wouldn't be until 1941 when she would learn of, and meet, her father for the first time. Their meeting was definitely a strange one. The family was heading to Edgefield, South Carolina for a family funeral, and one morning, Essie woke up to being told that she she was getting her shit together because she was about to meet her dad. They took a jaunt to the white side of town, pulling up to the Thurmond Law Offices. They were escorted inside and sat in a room where they waited. Imagine her surprise when one of the whitest people to ever exist entered the room and introduced himself. Essie very quickly learned that Strom Thurmond was her biological father. They had a simple but rather pleasant conversation. Thurmond showed no signs of being the comically racist gamer that he ended up being. Things were somewhat tense between Thurmond and Carrie, but there didn't seem to be any hard feelings between the two. The group talked about a lot of stuff, from fitness to politics politics and history. He was kinda the authority on fitness, since, you know, the fucker has a gym named after him for a reason, so naturally he hit her with the classic just don't gain weight Lamau. They parted ways with a handshake and a nod, concluding what must have been the most awkward and stressful family reunion of all time. Thurman's influence on her life was only just beginning, though. After the Second World War, Essie attended school at South Carolina State College. Thurman used his connections to help her along, paying for all of her education, even when she eventually went across the continent. Also, as a funny side note, apparently she joined the Delta Sigma Theta a sorority while here, and remained a member for much of her life. Which, honestly, you go girl, live that fucking college life. In 1948, she would marry, eventually having four kids with the men. Since raising a kid and going to school is fuck-ass difficult, she would drop out in 1949 so she could focus on just one of those things. When her husband completed law school, they moved to Georgia, then eventually to California. He would die in 1964, and she never remarried. Three of her kids are still alive, I believe, which is pretty cool, honestly. Essie and Thurman maintained a semi-cordial relationship, but it was very much kept on the down low. She stated that she had respect for the man and didn't want to potentially fuck up his career by going public with this information at an awkward time. Behind closed doors, however, the two got along. Well, got along as well as estranged secret family members can get along. They apparently debated politics and race several times, which, I mean, I would have fucking loved to be a fly in the wall during that particular discussion, but the point is that they were pretty chill. Thurman continued to help support her and her family, apparently sending her over a hundred thousand dollars over the course of his life. He would also do some other things, like writing a recommendation letter for her son to help him get into med school. This situation would be a pretty solid explanation for Thurman's pragmatist turn in the 70s. Having a secret black daughter in your ear would probably influence your decision-making on matters of race relations. After all of the kids got old enough to not immediately combust if left unsupervised, she would go back to school, first getting a bachelor's degree at Cal State LA in 1969, and then completing a master's degree in education at U of South Carolina. Her teaching career spanned three decades, during which she lived a relatively simple life, still connecting with her father every now and then. Six months after he died, she participated in a news conference where she spilled the tea and revealed that she was Thurman daughter. The family immediately accepted her, and in 2004, Thurman's statue was changed to include Essie's name on the list of his children. Her last few years were naturally a little more public, with her publishing her memoirs in 2005. She was also granted an honorary degree from South Carolina State, now University. Due to her gamer heritage, she also apparently applied to join the United Daughters of the Confederacy. Uh, okay. That, that, that doesn't seem... Uh, 
Ah, what the fuck ever, it's her life. She never got accepted in, however, as before she could be, she would pass away in Columbia, South Carolina on February 4th, 2013 at the age of 87. She did genuinely believe that Thurman loved her as his daughter, even though he wasn't really in a position to show it. Honestly, as much as this is a shorter story with a shorter video, I still thought it warranted an overview for this reason alone. Their relationship was very unique, and it's interesting to see how Thurman, pretty much the CEO of racism in the US for a while, treated his daughter. Love complicates things. Love across race lines even more so. Perhaps there was a part of the guy who didn't believe in the bullshit he was spewing. A part of the guy who just wanted to have a normal relationship with his daughter. A part that eventually did bubble up a tad and cause him to rethink some of his stances. Unfortunately, he's too dead to ask him about it. I didn't really know how to end this, to be completely honest, so I think I'll leave you with a quote that sums up their strange relationship pretty well. That being Thurman's response to receiving a Father's Day card. Dear S.E. May, Thank you for your kind remembrance on Father's Day. Affectionately, Strom Thurmond. That about does it for this video. Thanks for watching, and I'll see you around.